the toolbox killers, the most sadistic predators that will make you sick. Southern California. In 1979, two men prowled Southern California preying on young women to rape, torture, and kill. They would do this in a creepy big soundproof van, picking up hitchhikers and girls walking home alone. These two men are known as the Toolbox Killers because they would keep a toolbox inside their van and the instruments inside were used to torture and kill their victims. This is the story of two sadistic serial rapists and murderers and how they were caught. Investigation Hour. This video contains sexual assault, murder, and explicit details. Viewer discretion is advised. We'll start off covering their early childhood to get a better understanding of what made them. The most interesting thing I think for most of us is that these sadistic serial killers were once innocent young children. Since Lawrence Bittaker was at the forefront of the killings, we'll start with him. He was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on September 27, 1940. Shortly after his birth, he was given up for adoption and placed in an orphanage. He would soon be adopted into a family that moved around the U.S. quite a bit, not allowing him to have a stable home life. He grew up in four different states before finally settling in California. In 1957, at 17 years of age, Lawrence would drop out of high school. Rumored to have an extremely high IQ, he struggled socially in school. This same year, he would be arrested for auto theft, hit and run, and evading arrest in Long Beach, California, where he would end up in the California Youth Authority for two years. In 1959, he would be released and then reconvicted of auto theft again and sentenced to serve 18 months in the Oklahoma Federal Reformatory. He would continue to have a string of arrests and crimes in his teenage years and into adulthood, all consisting of robbery and petty crimes. While in prison, a psychiatrist would diagnose him with borderline psychosis having poor impulse control, and was very manipulative. Medication was administered. After going in and out of jail multiple times, he was arrested for assault on a man in a grocery store after trying to steal meat in 1974 at age 34. He was convicted and sent to California's men's colony at San Luis Obispo, where he would meet Roy Norris. In 1978, at 38, he met Roy Norris, where the two became inseparable. They both shared fantasies of domination through rape, torture, and murder of women. They made plans to kill together after they were both released. They said they wanted to have some fun together. Roy Norris had a similar upbringing to Bittaker. He was born on February 2nd, 1948, in Greeley, Colorado. His father worked in a scrapyard and his mother was a housewife who struggled with drug addiction. Norris was in and out of his parents' home and foster homes due to his parents' instability to care for him. He claims he was neglected as a child and wouldn't have access to clothing or food often. He claims that he was also the victim of sexual abuse when in the care of a Hispanic foster family. A year later, Norris would drop out of high school and joined the U.S. Navy. He would be stationed in San Diego from 1965 to 1969. Just like Bittaker, Norris had a string of crimes throughout his teens and adulthood, but he would be arrested for rape and attempt to commit rape in 1969. Only a mere three months after, he would try again two more times to rape two separate women. Luckily, the women survived and phoned the police. 
After this, Norris was evaluated by military psychologist and diagnosed with a severe schizoid personality. He was administered a discharge from the Navy. He doesn't stop there with trying to rape women. In May of 1970, Norris, still on bail, keep in mind, had been stalking the campus of San Diego University to find a victim. He would attack a female student and bash her over the head with a rock and would repeatedly beat her over the head until she fell to the floor. He would be arrested and convicted after this and sent to the California men's colony to meet his soulmate, Lawrence Bittaker. In 1978, Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker would end up meeting in the California men's colony. According to Norris, Bittaker had saved him from an attack by fellow inmates on two occasions. The two would bond over sexual violence and their hate for women. While alone, they would plan their killings. When they would be released, they planned to target young white females. Their goal was to kill one victim of each teenage year. So one 13 year old, one 14 year old, and on up to 19 years of age. On October 15th, 1978, Bitterker was released and returned to Los Angeles. He found work as a machinist and was making a decent living. He chose to live in a rather run-down motel in Burbank because there was always young women there. He shared that he would smoke marijuana and have beer so he could socialize with young teens. Neighbors who knew him described him as a generous, helpful fellow. He would even go as far as to help his neighbor who had a teen pregnancy, giving her money for food and clothing. He had always said he had a soft spot for pregnant women. Perhaps this ties to his childhood? Three months later, Norris was released from prison and moved to Redondo Beach to live with his mother. A month after his release, he raped a woman and abandoned her in the desert. He found work soon after as an electrician. The two would communicate through letters and would then meet up at a motel in downtown Los Angeles to plan their kills. Bittaker and Norris were organized thrill killers. They sat and planned their killings in the hopes of getting away with them. They determined they would need transportation and they would need a place where they can rape and kill their victims. Bittaker proposed they would need a van so they could easily open the door and snatch girls in the back without anyone noticing. The van was silver with one side being windowless. They would go as far as soundproofing the van so they had more privacy and no one could hear their screams. They called it Murder Mac. They even installed a bed in the back end of the van. On June 24th, 1979, they would claim their first victim, 16-year-old Lucinda Lynn Schaefer. At 7.46 p.m., Norris had spotted Schaefer walking down the road alone. She was on her way home from a church meeting in Redondo Beach. Roy and Lawrence had been in the area since 11 a.m., drinking beers and flirting with girls, assumingly trying to find their perfect victim. As Lucinda walked, they pulled up beside her in the van, offering her marijuana and a lift home. She wasn't biting. Roy then hopped out and dragged her into the van, shutting the door and driving off. With Bittaker driving, he turned the stereo on full blast. Roy tied her up and gagged her. Bittaker would take them to an old spot he knew growing up and would often go hiking there with his first girlfriend the San Gabriel Mountains. They entered a fire road where they broke the lock to the gate and replaced it with their own lock and key. Bittaker would later remark on the night that Lucinda displayed a magnificent state of self-control and composed acceptance of the conditions of which she had no control. She shed no tears, offered no resistance, and expressed no great concern for her safety. I guess she knew what was coming. This is his way of downplaying the events that took place. 
not taking responsibility and using manipulation to make it seem not as bad as it really was. That night, the two would take turns raping her multiple times inside the van while one kept watch outside. After they had their way with her, the two contemplated letting her go or killing her. After deciding that killing her was the only option, it was left up to Norris to do it. Lucinda would plead before being killed to let her pray to God beforehand. After that, Norris looked her in the eyes and said, No, there are only devils here. Norris would then manually strangle her only to become disturbed by the look in her eyes and stop. He ran to the front of the van and vomited. He couldn't continue. Bittaker would then strangle her into convulsions and then he did something that is so vile. He took a metal clothes hanger, put it around her neck and twisted it with pliers until it was the size of a quarter. They then proceeded to wrap her body in a shower curtain and dispose of her over a steep hillside. Two weeks after they murdered Lucinda, they are on to their next victim, 18-year-old Andrea Joy Hall, on July 8, 1979. Walking along the Pacific Coast Highway, a popular highway on the coast of California, Andrea hitchhikes, hoping to catch a lift. Norris and Bittaker see her on the highway, get into a vehicle, and they tail the vehicle all the way to Redondo Beach, where Andrea then exits. They drove up to her and offered her a cold drink from the back of the van. As she reached for the cooler, Norris jumped out, grabbing for her. He twisted her arm behind her back and subdued her, tying her up and gagging her. Back to the San Gabriel Mountains they would go, pulling up into the fire road. They raped her several times, just like they did with Lucinda. Then they drove to a second location deeper into the mountains, where Bittaker would force oral sex on her. Then take several nude Polaroids of her. This was something Bittaker would do with many of his victims. He wanted to relive his killings by having these Polaroids to use later. They would then drive to a third location. While Norris drove to the liquor store, Bittaker had Andrea alone to himself. He would continue to take photos of her, and one of the most shocking images he caught was when he told her, I'm going to kill you, and snapped a Polaroid to catch the expression on her face just as he said it to her. This is said by investigators to be one of the most sadistic things to do, and seeing the photo was heart-wrenching. Norris would describe it as sheer terror in her eyes. Bittaker would have her beg for her life, offering up reasons as to why she should be spared, until he would finally thrust an ice pick deep into her ear, hitting her brain. Tragically, this is supposed to be one of the most painful deaths. He would then turn her over to thrust the ice pick into her other eardrum until the handle broke off. It unfortunately doesn't stop there. Bittaker hadn't had enough. While potentially still alive, Bittaker strangled her and then threw her off the cliffside. Investigators would later recover her remains with the ice pick still lodged into her skull. Two months go by. On September 3rd, Bittaker and Norris would spot two young girls sitting at a bus stop near Hermosa Beach, one aged 13 and the other 15. They offered the girls a ride in which they accepted. They told them they were headed to the beach. As Bittaker drove, the girls noticed he was going in the wrong direction and had left the Pacific Coast Highway. He was heading toward the San Gabriel Mountains. As the two girls spoke up, Norris and Bittaker brush off their concerns but the girls aren't having it. Jacqueline Lamp, aged 13, attempts to open the sliding door, which Norris then hits her in the back of the head and knocks her briefly unconscious. He overpowers Jackie Gilliam, gagging her and tying her up. Jacqueline regains consciousness and tries to escape once more, 
before Norris notices and twists her arm behind her back, subduing her. The two girls were driven to the San Gabriel Mountains and were kept captive in the van for nearly two days being tortured. The men would even sleep next to their two victims as one kept watch. Bittaker would make Jacqueline, 13, pose for his Polaroid collection, even having Norris take photos of him with Jackie. He really wanted to have souvenirs of his victims. He was escalating in his sadistic and perverse nature. During one of the three sexual assaults against Jackie, Bittaker would set up a tape recorder in the van, telling her to feel free to express your pain. These poor girls were tortured in unimaginable ways. Bittaker tortured Jackie by stabbing her breasts with an ice pick and using pliers to tear off part of her nipple. Even their death wouldn't be quick. Norris claimed he had told Bittaker that Jacqueline, 13, should be killed quickly as she cooperated more. Bittaker's reply was chilling. No, they only die once anyway. He then thrust an ice pick into her ear and strangled her to death. Jackie was then forced out of the van and Bittaker shouted, you wanted to stay a virgin, now you can die a virgin. And then Norris bludgeoned her head with a sledgehammer. Norris noticed she was still alive and continued to bludgeon her seven times while Bittaker continued to strangle her. As I write this story and research, I find myself taking breaks and losing focus. The vile, pure evil things that these men were doing to these very young girls is shocking and terrifying. Reading about this in detail has not been easy. And I'm ashamed that humans are capable of such incredibly horrific things. My heart goes out to the victims and their families. On October 31st, 1979, Bittaker and Norris would claim their final victim, a young 16-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford. During the trial, she would evoke the strongest emotional response in the courtroom. The prosecutor played 17 minutes of a tape recording right before Shirley's death. We've all heard women scream in horror films. Still, we know that no one is really screaming. Why? Simply because an actress can't produce some sounds that convince us that something vile and heinous is happening. If you ever heard that tape, there is just no possible way that you'd not begin crying and trembling. I doubt you could listen to more than a full 60 seconds of it. Shirley had just left a Halloween party, hitchhiking her way home in the Sunland Tahunga area. Investigators believe she accepted the ride from Bittaker because he was a local at the restaurant she waited at. Instead of taking her straight to the San Gabriel Mountains, Bittaker pulled over down a secluded street where Norris pulled out a knife. Then he bound and gagged her. Norris then drove the van aimlessly for about an hour while Bittaker tormented her, mocking and beating her with his fists, demanding her to scream louder. What's the matter? Don't you like to scream? He said to her on the tape recording. Shirley begged and pleaded to which Bittaker replied, scream as loud as you wish. They tortured her with pliers while simultaneously sodomizing her. After about two hours of vicious torture, Norris finally killed Shirley by strangling her with a wire hanger. The two decided to discard the body a different way this time, maybe because it was Halloween, or maybe because they were getting progressively more and more sadistic and careless. They drove to a random house in Sunland, and Norris discarded her body on the front lawn. The body was found by a jogger that same morning, the jogger didn't know it was real. They had initially thought it was a leftover prop from Halloween. 
Later, an autopsy would be done and revealed she had died of strangulation after receiving blunt force trauma to the head, face, breasts, and elbow. As police are baffled by this gruesome murder, Bittaker and Norris drive around planning their next victim. The following month, in November 1979, Norris had confided in a friend named Joseph Jackson, whom he had met at the California Men's Colony. He had told him details of all five murders and added that they had three other victims in which they were abducted and got away or raped and then released. Jackson then contacted his attorney after learning these details and he agreed to inform the LAPD and the Hermosa Beach Police. A detective named Paul Bynum was assigned to investigate Jackson's claims. He would learn that a lot of the reports between June and October matched details of what Jackson was claiming. A female survivor, Robin Robeck, mid-30s, had positively identified both Norris and Bittaker as the two men that maced her eyes, forced her into their van, and raped her, then letting her go. On November 20th, the two were arrested. The police would then surveil Norris and would arrest him for buying marijuana and breaking parole. At the same time, Bittaker would be arrested for the rape of Robin Robeck. A search of Bittaker's apartment would reveal several Polaroids of the missing girls. Then the search of his van revealed a sledgehammer, a plastic bag filled with lead weights, a book about police radio frequencies, a jar of Vaseline, two necklaces belonging to two of the victims, and finally the tape recording of the rape and torture of a young girl. Inside Norris's apartment, they found a bracelet of one of the victims, kept as a souvenir, and more Polaroids of missing girls. In total, there were almost 500 Polaroids found of various young women and girls in public. Most of these images were taken at Hermosa Beach, Redondo Beach, and Burbank High School. 39-year-old detective Paul Bynum was the chief investigator of this case. He would retire and later commit suicide with a 38 caliber pistol in December of 1987. In his 10-page suicide note, Bynum mentioned that the murders haunted him and he feared that Bittaker and Norris would get out of prison and come find him and kill him. On November 20th, 1979, police began questioning Norris about the rape of Robin Robeck and the evidence found inside his and Bittaker's home. Norris would deny any involvement until police showed him the evidence they found in his home. He would slowly start to confess after confessing to nearly everything in sick detail, he recounted he and Bittaker committed these acts for fun. In a press conference, LA County Sheriff Peter Oicha stated that five charges of first degree murder would be sought against both Bittaker and Norris. He also mentioned that 60 of the women in the Polaroids had been identified and confirmed alive and unharmed. Unfortunately, 19 women from those photographs have been reported missing. It's more than possible that these women were some more of their victims. Norris agreed to take police to the San Gabriel Mountains to try and recover the bodies of the victims. The skeletal remains of Lamp and Gilliam were later found in February 1980. In February 1980, they were formally charged with the murders of five girls. Bittaker was denied bail, but Norris's bail was set to $10,000. Norris took a plea deal to testify against Bittaker. In return, he would not receive the death penalty or life without parole. Norris would plead guilty to four counts of first-degree murder, one count of second-degree, two counts of rape, and one count of robbery. On May 7, 1980, Norris was sentenced to 45 years 
with eligibility of parole in 2010. On April 24, 1980, Bitteker was arraigned on 29 charges of kidnapping, rape, sodomy, murder, criminal conspiracy, and possession of a firearm. Bitteker refused to speak during the arraignment. He wouldn't even speak to plead not guilty or guilty. During Bitteker's trial, lasting three weeks, several witnesses testified against him, claiming Bitteker had shown them images of victims or bragged about the killings and torture of his victims. He showed no remorse and even wrote a book called The Last Ride, detailing his partnership and killings with Norris. Bitteker's defense argued that Norris was behind all the murders and rape. Richard Schupman even testified that Norris had repeatedly talked about his desires for raping young girls and that the Polaroid taken of the facial expression of Hall has invoked a sexual stimulus for him. Bitteker's audio tape was also played for the jury with a warning. For those of you who do not know what hell is like, you will find out. People wept or left the courtroom during the 17-minute playback, while Bitteker sat unaffected, smiling, during the entire duration of the audio. This audio recording is now used to desensitize and train FBI agents. Bitteker took the stand and testified on his own behalf, claiming that he had only paid the girls to take their photographs and to have sex, but that somehow Norris would take the girls to the San Gabriel Mountains to rape and murder them alone. The jury found Bitteker guilty of five counts of first-degree murder, one count of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, five charges of kidnapping, nine charges of rape, two charges of forced oral copulation, and one charge of sodomy. The jury deliberated for 90 minutes before deciding their verdict. Bitteker was sentenced to death for the five counts of first-degree murder. His execution was set for December 29, 1989. Bitteker appealed this, but he was denied on June 11, 1990. The new execution date was July 23, 1991, but it was appealed yet again and extended. Lawrence Bitteker died while awaiting the death penalty at San Quentin State Prison on December 13, 2019, at 79 years old. He died of natural causes. Roy Norris was incarcerated at Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility. He died on February 24, 2020, at 72 years old. He also died of natural causes. Death penalty sentences are never swift, and unfortunately, Lawrence Bitteker and Roy Norris did not get what they deserved. The prosecutor during trial told jurors he wished the justice system would allow these men to be tortured just as they did to their victims. It is a real shame that these men were not put to death sooner. For 40 years, Lawrence Bitteker was silent about his crimes. Criminologist Laura Brand befriended him and interviewed him for five years to uncover some of his secrets and to find out where the missing bodies of Andrea Joy Hall and Lucinda Lynn Schaefer. She also spoke with Roy Norris as well over this five-year span, but he wasn't as forthcoming as Bitteker was. Both in phone interviews and in person, she had started off writing letters to death row inmates to try and study them. To her surprise, she received many letters in response. She would build a relationship with Bitteker, talking for hours over the phone, building rapport. After three years, Laura became pregnant and would then go and visit Bitteker in person, six months pregnant, to interview him on death row. He had finally agreed to give up where the bodies were that same day. Thanks for listening. If you're into solved and unsolved crimes and strange mysteries, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on our weekly videos released every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like 
It would really help us out. Until next time.